This is the big picture, an official television report of the United States Army, produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Master Sergeant Stuart Quaid. Today, when science is presenting the American fighting man with an increasingly broad array of new and mighty weapons, we sometimes are inclined to forget the contributions to victory made by the basic tools of defense in the past. The subject of today's big picture is rarely thought of as a weapon, but in a very real sense it is. In many roads to glory, we will see just how large a role the Army truck has played in preserving the freedom of the United States in the 20th century. The United States Department of Defense today handles the greatest volume of freight and passenger traffic of any organization in the world. The Army, under the new single manager concept, has the responsibility for all the military traffic management on land in the country. Moving millions of passengers and millions of tons of cargo every year is the job of the Army Transportation Corps. Its personnel and equipment today perform unparalleled peacetime services and are ready to undertake the added supply burden in the event of war. By its very nature, the atomic and missile army of today calls for great mobility and dispersion. Rapid delivery of men and supplies to the combat zone is essential. The Army Transportation Corps is gearing itself today to the fullest support of these highly mobile, widely dispersed combat forces. Under the sweeping reorganization of our airborne divisions with its five battle groups, is the first divisional-sized unit to be developed that is entirely air-transportable with current equipment. With fighting men hitting the battlefield with unmatched speed, our supply forces work with equal swiftness, giving infantry and armor the weapons and machines where and when they are needed. Since World War II, airborne troops have been a hard-hitting, high-priority part of the Army's defense forces. Through new techniques, greater experience, and the will to improve, the Transportation Corps and the Quartermaster Corps have made the parachuting of bigger and heavier equipment possible. Today, multi-ton trucks are dropped to earth to strengthen the fighting power of the all-important foot soldiers. Other vehicles, too large to move except by ship a few years ago, can be flown to any part of the world today. This means better supply and greater mobility to the infantryman gives him more fighting punch. Airborne vehicles, large and small, parachuted or delivered by cargo planes, help give our modern army its new look. This is a dynamic fighting force which bears but little resemblance to the armies America fielded in the past to preserve our freedom. In the days of World War I, the truck is a relatively new machine, its potentialities little explored. The foot soldier is just that, and the workhorse of the army is the horse or mule. As a nation, America was taking its first steps in the automotive age. By war's end, greater mechanization has been achieved. The truck's role in battle is growing. Then all too soon, blitzkrieg. September 1st, 1939, the face of war is changed as the Nazi forces slash into Poland. Nazi shock troops riding in tanks and trucks race through and around the stunned Polish army. This is but a dress rehearsal for conquest to come. Tanks and trucks, a shock world perceives, are the backbone of the fast-striking mechanized Wehrmacht. The full realization of the meaning of Blitzkrieg is felt when the Netherlands and Belgium are invaded. Never have fighting men moved so fast to take objective after objective. Never have armies moved so fast to swallow whole countries. In the wake of the plains, the Panzer Divisions strike out, driving between the converging armies of the Allies. 
All the deep dug, heavily armed defenses of the French are bypassed by the swift moving columns. The rolling army is the winning army. The fall of France causes Americans to look to their own defenses. We are short on weapons, long on manpower and know-how. Wehrmacht success with military trucks and vehicles has been noted by American leaders. Once we have toughened ourselves for battle, we too shall be a mechanized fighting machine. In 1942, we and the British have the power to strike back. The place is sun-baked, sand-swept North Africa. Here, our forces will score their first victories over the vaunted Wehrmacht. the newly born Army Transportation Corps will play a decisive role. In many battles, trucks are the sole means of supply and they perform heroically. One motorized unit consisting of 166 vehicles goes through 32 days of continuous combat with only 12 minor mechanical failures. With trucks bringing up the fighting hardware, the Allies are able to face the Wehrmacht on equal terms for the first time. With guns and ammunition in plentiful supply, American and British forces give the Nazis a taste of their own medicine. Africa, the desert fox Rommel meets defeat, no longer master of mechanized warfare. Half a world away in Southeast Asia, one of the greatest sagas in the history of military supply is being written. With the fall of Burma to the Japanese army, we have been cut off from our allies in China, except by air over the Himalayas. Across the rice fields and the towering mountains beyond, a road would have to be built. At the little village of Lido in northeast India, where the rail line ends, army engineers set to work to create a supply highway between inland China and the port of India. Thousands upon thousands of native laborers are recruited to help with the job. For centuries, nothing better than ox trails had been carved through this rugged and hostile countryside. But bulldozers of the clearing and grubbing gangs set about carving a trail through the jungle. Trees are felled, lumber hewed, and bridges built across streams never spanned before. The advanced parties battle their way relentlessly eastward, blazing the trail. This will be a road designed for trucks. Despite jungle and swamps, poisonous insects and snakes, over trails and mountains. Despite the flooding rains of the summertime monsoon, the road is pushed forward. Following the cats and cans and sheep's foot tampers, graders shape the road embankment. Thanks to a monumental combination of brains and courage, devotion and sweat, the road is built, and the first convoy sets out from Lido for the Chinese border, nearly 500 miles away. The truck convoy rolls over a road which at best is a truck driver's nightmare. The highway itself dips and climbs, twists and turns back on itself in a series of dizzying turns. The trucks and drivers are exposed to enemy fire, often before China comes into view. 
But they get through now and thousands of times again in the months ahead. It is possible that only American engineering genius could have built this road. It is certain that only American trucks and drivers could have utilized it. The multi-drive vehicles developed by American peacetime industry easily adapt themselves to meet the almost impossible demands of the Lido Road. They turn a jungle and mountain highway into a life-saving line of supply at this critical juncture in history. But the Transportation Corps' biggest test is yet to come. On the 6th of June, D-Day, more than 250,000 Allied soldiers charge ashore in Normandy. If this finger hold on the coast is to be held, expanded, the troops will need thousands of additional combat items, millions of tons of supply. They will need them first on the beachhead, then a mile inland, then hundreds of miles inland. To direct and handle the flood of supplies are the Quartermaster and Transportation Corps. Offshore barges, the loaded trucks surge ashore. By radio, the vital supply trucks and tanks are directed. For every five men put ashore, one invasion vehicle is landed. men and combat vehicles are landed, the massive supply problems mount. Ammunition for the rifles and tank guns, food for the men, gasoline for the lumbering vehicles. A gap from the beaches to the front lines must be breached, a job only trucks can do here. The ships and landing craft have done their part well. After the initial landing, the world waits anxiously for the answer to the basic questions. Can the Allies break from their tiny perimeter? Can the supplies be moved fast enough in sufficient quantities to expand the bridgehead? The responsibility rests with the Transportation Corps. As the Allies continue their swift advance, Truck convoys continue with their mammoth supply operation, driving day and night to set a logistical record unparalleled in history. Rain and mud combine to slow the pace to create added problems, but never for long. With the Allied breakthrough, it is no longer a question of reaching the front lines a short distance from the beach. The front lines are far inland and moving fast. The caravans of the Green Diamond, XYZ, White Ball, and others now make supply history. Among the most memorable is the remarkable Red Ball Express. It is organized to supply General Patton's armored columns 400 miles away with urgently needed supplies. Experienced drivers are ready to drive day and night. The trucks will travel a one-way speedway. Only vehicles displaying the Red Ball may pass. Thousands of American lives depend on the success of their supply mission. During the crucial stages of the operation, more than 400 trucks an hour rumble along this route. 7,000 tons of ammunition and hardware are delivered to the front in a single day. The Red Ball Express rolls on around the clock. It rolls on under withering enemy fire. It rolls on day after day, night after night, despite the enemy. The Red Ball Express rolls on until its mission is successfully completed. While the Allies advance in Europe, 
more American soldiers fight another kind of war on the scattered islands of the Pacific. Here, if possible, the supply problem is even greater, for the battlefields are even farther from the production centers, and most of the islands offer no network of roads. Island after island falls to our army. Where vehicles can't travel, men move the weapons. Where roads do exist, trucks once again bring up the vital supplies, tow the artillery from position to position to drive the enemy deeper and deeper into his jungle lair. On most of the islands, roads or no roads, trucks provide the sole means of supply and transportation, make it possible to hit the enemy fast before he can recover from the initial shock of invasion. Among the most important vehicles in the Pacific is the commonplace dump truck. As well as being pressed into service as a troop carrier, they combine with other construction equipment to repair airfields and to build new bases from which American planes can strike at the Japanese homeland. To make homes for the increasing number of new bombers arriving from the United States, on island after island, building airfield after airfield, the construction men of the CBs and the Army Corps of Engineers work unflaggingly, sending more and more planes along, planes carrying greater payloads than ever before, until victory is complete. Five years later, when the Cold War turns hot, Men of the United States Army find themselves serving once more in Asia, fighting another, even more implacable foe. At the outbreak of hostilities in Korea, a highway system as such is non-existent. Except for a few main roads, the country through which our supplies must be carried is linked by primitive cart trails. In conjunction with the Transportation Corps' military railway service, the truck drivers are called upon to carry a large share of the supply load. Said an American soldier writing in Pacific Stars and Stripes in 1952, the story of the truckers of the Army Transportation Corps is the portrayal of men, wheels, and guts, braving the most perilous roads in the world to expeditiously deliver the vital supplies, and men of war to the forwardmost outposts of the 8th Army in Korea. The familiar sight of a standard six by six heading north with no regard for the unseen guerrilla dangers or incoming enemy artillery exemplifies the courage of the men behind the wheel of these world famous vehicles, the trucks of the Army Transportation Corps. But these trucks bring more than packaged death to the stubborn enemy. To the civilian population of the Republic of South Korea, they bring the stuff of life itself the bags of rice which mean the difference between survival and death for helpless and homeless, the aged, the women and the children. The road to glory is a two-way street, leading to victory in battle and to charity among the stricken. Wherever the emergency, at home or abroad, the trucks of the army do yeoman service. 
Called repeatedly in time of national disaster, the trucks and drivers are quick to respond. They are constantly ready to perform relief tasks that only they are suited for. To fight the floodwaters, they bring the equipment for sandbags and the men to build the dikes. A flexible, highly mobile emergency task force, the fleets of the Army trucks not only supply men and material for preventive work at the scene, but also help the stricken population directly. Water-going vehicles, developed to Army specifications to meet Army requirements, cruise the flooded streets, searching out those trapped in their inundated homes. Such scenes of rescue have been witnessed scores of times throughout the country in recent years, and the men of our Army take great pride in their mercy work. To help the shattered community get back on its feet again, the Army trucks bring in emergency rations to feed the tired and hungry, provide the materials for emergency shelters for the homeless. To the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland are sent 